Welcome. I'm glad you're with me tonight. I think we're going to have a good time and I think you're going to learn a lot of stuff. If you're new to iridology, you're in for a real treat and if you're experienced, I'm sure you're going to take home something that you didn't know before as well. I promise that I am going to make tonight time well spent for you. We're going to be together for a little over an hour. I could probably drag it on for two hours, but I'm going to talk kind of fast because I've got a lot of information I want to share with you tonight. We're going to do a complete case study from beginning to end. And uh, when you're listening to all the thinking processes of what's going on, it takes longer than it takes if you're just doing it. I hope that makes sense. And you know, when you have to stop and explain all the pieces, it, it will take a bit longer. One of the things that I have learned in my 35 plus years in the holistic wellness industry is that excellent healers always keep learning. And they know they don't know it all. So congratulations for being here tonight, for proving that you are among the cream of the crop you want to be the best, you want to know the most effective things to help your clients. I'd like to do a little survey here just right off the top to, um, I always struggle with these, so let's see if I can do this right. Okay, um, little question here, what kind of background do you have in holistic wellness? If you'd go ahead and click on whatever is your thing? I would love to hear that from you. Lovely. Give you just another 10 or 15 seconds for those of you who haven't voted yet. I know who you are. No, I don't actually know who you are. <laughs> but I know some of you haven't voted yet. I'd like to give you the chance to weigh in on this because knowing who I've got in the audience allows me to tweak the presentation on the fly to make sure it matches and meets your needs the most efficiently. All right, that's it. Thank you so very much. That tells me that every one of you has some nutrition background, so that's where we're going to really angle this from. Alrighty, so before we start the assessment that we're going to do tonight, I want to spend just a minute looking at why iridology can be a powerful tool in your wellness practice, especially in your nutrition practice. Um, and this is just so, so important because I know that with all of your learning and all of your best intentions, you're facing some challenges or you wouldn't be here tonight. And you might even be creating some of those challenges and not realizing it because, you know, in nutrition school, and I know this from speaking to recent nutrition grads, they don't actually teach you how to start your business or manage your business. They teach you about a bank, getting a bank account, about doing, getting business cards, but they don't teach you the inner workings of how to make a business. So uh, some things that you, they won't have taught you are things like, they didn't teach you exactly where to start in your recommendations and setting up your therapeutic priorities. Excuse me. So you've got a ton of information in your head, right? And you probably use a questionnaire and it probably asks a ton of questions. And if you really looked at those questions, probably 80% of them, maybe 90% are actually irrelevant for the problem your client really wants your help with. And they're irrelevant for how you are going to help your client. And so, you know, if you knew how to set the priorities, how to get to the root of a problem and set priorities so that you could set a therapeutic sequence for each client that was individualized, it might be good for you. You might also have this problem that I hear from a lot of nutritionists is that you spend a lot of your own time unpaid doing research for your clients and then doing program development for them. So, you know, for every hour you get paid for, you probably spend another two or three hours on your client's behalf, but it's not helping you at all in building your business, really. And the third thing is that so many nutritionists feel inadequate. They feel like they don't know enough. 
they feel like they've got to give their client everything so that when they spend their time doing this research and building this program, they actually end up putting too much information in the package. So the clients end up so overwhelmed that they think, I could never do all of that. I could never be that perfect. I'm not even going to try. So they don't come back. Or sometimes they are able to pull out those one or two little gems that they really need right now and so they don't need to come back again anyways. So do any of those things sound like you? If you do any of these, if you've got any of these problems, will you raise your hand and know that nobody else can see this? This is just between you and me. Do you have any of these problems? Yeah, yeah. You know, you're not alone. You are so not alone. Thank you for sharing on that. I appreciate that. So how do I know that those are problems that you might be having? And I know some of you didn't raise your hand when you maybe thought I should, but you were maybe a little bit embarrassed. I know because I've been there myself. Like I said, I've been in this industry for 35 years. And I can tell you that for the first 10 or 15 years, I was making those mistakes left, right, and center. And I've interviewed a lot of nutritionists, herbalists, and other holistic practitioners, and almost every one of them have been there too. So if you were too shy to raise your hand, you know what? It's okay because I've got your back. I'm going to help you with this. So this is who I am and why I am qualified to share this information with you. Because you need to know that, right? You need to know that, that I know what I'm talking about. Well, this is me. That's me in my office. My name is Judith Cobb. I'm a, I've been a holistic health coach since 1981, a master herbalist since 1983. I did the training to become a nutritional consultant practitioner and got that designation in 1994. And then I decided to use that same set of training and uh, the, the NNC, the, um, oh yeah, I can remember which organization it was. CANNP, that's who they are, um, allowed me to join their organization in 2016. I've been a certified iridologist since 1993 and I did iridology for years before I got certified. And I'm a certified comprehensive iridology instructor with IPA and have been that for just about exactly a year now. I've been teaching wellness professionals like you since 1985. When I started there were almost no training programs. I was fortunate to be able to apprentice with another practitioner for nearly a year and continued my studies on my own and gathered lots of information and started teaching people in 1985. I'm a wife of one, a mom of seven, and a grandma of seven. Now this is actually one of the reasons why you should listen to me. And that is because I'm a mom of seven, and mom of seven has nothing to do with nutrition. I'll totally admit that. But if you have four children, are you going to take advice on parenting from someone who's got one child or someone who has no children? No. I don't take parenting advice from anyone who has less than six children because they have not a clue what it's like to raise seven kids. I have a friend who has 11 children. Yes, she is a saint. When she says, this is what we did in our house, I sit up and I listen. And I take notes and I often try to copy what she did because she's been very successful with her family. Well, having 35 years of experience as a herbalist, iridologist, nutritionist, and a million other credentials under my belt, hopefully in your eyes gives me the background to share something valuable with you. And I'm going to share a lot of what I've learned, well, not everything, but some key points tonight because I want to save you time, I want to save you money, I want to save you frustration, I want to save you from being discouraged because, you know, I've spent a schwack load of money on courses and things that got me nowhere and I've spent a little bit of money really well on courses with people who could train me and teach me what I needed to know and get me going in the right direction. That's the kind of, of instructor I want to be for you tonight. So how can iridology help you? Well, 
it can help you eliminate those intake forms except the waiver and release form which every one of you should be using with every one of your clients to protect your behind and it's that legal stuff. Iridology can help you start creating deep rapport from the moment you start the consultation instead of starting with you looking down to read that awful intake form. Now somebody who's with us tonight is going to chuckle because I went out for tea with her this week and as I somebody I've never met. I like to meet new nutritionists in Calgary. So whenever I can connect with one and just meet them at Starbucks or Tim Hortons or whatever for a cup of tea, I like to do that. So I met this one lovely lady and as we were sitting across the table talking about business and where we wanted our businesses to go, I looked at her and I started listing a couple of things that I could see from her eyes that I, I, um, I asked her some questions about how's this, how's that. And and then after I had done that and we'd chatted for a few more minutes, I said, now, I want you to take a step back and, and just remember how it felt when I asked you specific questions that related exactly to you, what did that do for the rapport and the trust that you have for me? And she said, well, it skyrocketed, right? And that wasn't her exact word. But she implied that, wow, yeah, I really felt a deep connection. So iridology can help you do that as well, can help you get that deep connection very quickly. It can help you do a core assessment in less than five minutes. Uh, note, it'll help you to know the right questions to ask, to prioritize what needs to be dealt with first, and to create a, create a therapeutic priorities sequence for future consultations. It will eliminate your unpaid homework time. If you can do an assessment in less than five minutes and outline six or eight key things that you picked up in that assessment that need to be, to be worked with, then you want to break those down to one key thing per session, right? Because that is how you will stop overwhelming your clients. Oops, there we go. If this sounds too good to be true, and for some of you, you're going, yeah, right, you can do this. Some of you know I can do this because you've been with me a few times or you've actually taken other courses with me so you know I can do this. I'm going to demonstrate how this works in just a minute with, because with iridology, you can literally gather a base of information, then let it guide you to the questions you need to ask. The assessment becomes a part of the rapport building intake without wasting any client time filling out two or three or 20, I did say 20 there, pages of intake. One of the nutritionists I interviewed about six or eight months ago, just, uh, I like to keep doing market research, said her intake form is 20 pages long. Ikes. I recently spoke with another practitioner who confessed she'd just spent three hours with a client instead of the one that they had booked. And yeah, she's helping the person, but she didn't get paid for the extra two hours. So I had to ask her, so which of your own bills does that mean you won't be able to pay? Because rather than seeing three clients in three hours, you saw one in three hours and you only charged for one. And she also commented, she said her intake form is six pages long and partway into it, her client who has arthritis was complaining about how much it hurt her hands to fill out the form. I'm going to teach you tonight how to avoid giving away three hours for the price of one and how to eliminate those lengthy intake forms. You ready? Let's get started. The first thing you need to know is that you need some equipment. When you start out in this, this is all you need and you don't even need all of this. You need a good 5 to 8x magnifying glass. So five, six, seven, eight, somewhere in there. And a good pen light that has a good white light in it. You could, could instead use a magnifying stamp collector's light. Or there's lots of people now that sell handy dandy little devices specifically for doing iridology. So that's all it's going to cost you. Depending on what you buy, it could be cost you maybe a whole whopping $30. Right? But that gets you started and it gets you started well. When you look into someone's eyes, you can begin to understand their health story. And this is the person we're going to be working with tonight. With iridology, you will never diagnose, you will never prescribe. You will assess, and you will educate. 
You will understand just by looking at the eye what specific questions you need to ask to get deep information from your clients that will allow you to help them in the most powerful ways. You won't be wasting any time on irrelevant questions that have no value for your client and that will not progress their therapeutic protocol at all. You will be better able to lead people to improved health because you lasered in on what they need. The IRIDES, that's I-R-I-D-E-S, that's the correct plural for iris when we're talking about the eyes, are genetic indicators. That doesn't mean they can't change or that they don't change, but it does mean two things. Any changes you see are genetically programmed just like your hair color is genetically programmed to change, or you can have acquired signs of things that develop over time. Your eyes don't change in relation you can use a person, and once you understand that, then use your nutrition background to create a foundational nutro, basically an outline that will carry them through probably the next 20 or 30 years of their life without even needing a tweak, maybe a minor tweak here or there. Where you're going to see changes is in the sclera, in the white of the eye. Capillaries in the sclera are very reactive. When they get inflamed and swollen and engorged, we know things are happening. When they're calm and quiet and subdued and pale, we know things are in a much better place. When we know about sclerology, when we understand what those capillaries relate to, what organs they relate to, and what that particular type of a situation with the capillary means, we're going to look at a few of these later on just very lightly, then you can create the dynamic part of the person's wellness program. So their food and maybe a few key supplements are the undercurrent, the foundation, and then and that's determined by the iris. What you see in the sclera tells you what you're going to be doing dynamically, what's going to be changing and being tweaked constantly to keep this body moving in the right direction. So let's do a consultation and see what this looks like. What information do you ask for at the very start of a consultation? I'd like you to, in that questions box, go ahead and type in uh, real quick, lightning fingers. What information do you ask for at the very start of a consultation? We're going to be really interactive tonight, so you got to get those hands warmed up for me and be ready to type all kinds of stuff because we're going to have fun. You're going to prove that you know a lot. Ah, Donna, good to see you tonight. I'm glad you're with me. Uh, she said, what brought them in to see you? Yeah, and she doesn't mean what kind of car. She means what's the symptom that, that brought them in? What's their concern? Excellent. Good job. You want to know their age, their weight, their sex, and what medications they are on. Absolutely. Good answer. Good answer, Allison. Good to see you here tonight, too. Whoops, I didn't mean to do that. I meant to, oh dear, just a moment. I've um, hidden my questions box again. There we go. Let's bring that back to the side where I can actually use it for good. There we go. There we go. That's what I wanted. Okay. Good job. Uh, anything else? Is that all you ask for on a first appointment? Who referred them or how did they hear about me? Oh, that's a very good question. Good job, Donna. Excellent. That is a good question as well. Good. Thank you. So, you know, we're pretty much on the same, same page. I want to know their name, their gender, their age, their height, their weight. I want to know what problems they want my help with, just like Donna suggested. And I do want to know any medical diagnoses and prescriptions they currently have. You people ace that. Well done. I really, really think it's important that we understand any medical diagnoses we need to know to protect ourselves. Have they been to a doctor for this? 
and we need to note, yes, they have and who the doctor was. And we need to know prescriptions because if we're using foods, as we all do, sometimes there are contraindications. Certain meds cannot be taken with certain foods and certain herbs cannot be used with certain meds. So we need to know that. All right. So here we have our client. She is a female. She's age 52 and she weighs 130 pounds. I forgot to note her height on this one but she was not overweight. So nothing new so far. You all have that totally under your belt. And then I asked any diagnoses and she said she'd been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis and she was perimenopausal. She had lots of hot flashes. And then she listed off the drug cocktail she was using. Celebrex, Nexium, methotrexate for the rheumatoid arthritis and clonazepam. So she's on this whole barrage of med medications. But we're going to find that there's actually a lot more to her story than what she has said. And it's going to be the questions I ask that get the information. So as I sat down with her, I picked up my magnifying glass and I asked permission to look in her left eye and then I asked permission to look in her right eye. I made quick notes about what I saw. Now these aren't the real names of the, the iris signs but this is what you would recognize them as if you're new to iridology. So this is what I wrote down. She has blue irises, blue irides. Uh, they look very dark gray here. Photography is notoriously inaccurate for color reproduction, but they were a, a dark a dark steel blue. She has lots of white clouding, and it's not just my lousy photography of not being able to get things in focus, but there's lots of clouding in here. Very white fibers. Very white fibers scattered throughout her iris. She has a white zone hugging areas around her pupil. I noted that the pupil's edge looked quite frayed in places and that when we came to the outer edge of the iris it looks a little bit smudged like someone kind of took whipped cream and smeared it real thin or something like that. I noted that areas down here at six o'clock in both eyes look much darker. We call that being rarefied. And I also noted that up here in her right iris between 8 and 9 o'clock and even extending up, we're rarefied here but we've got lots of darker tissue up here as well. So that is what I saw just really quick, just magnifying glass, check, 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 wrote down eight things. You saw how quickly that went for me to list those eight things and describe them a little bit to you. When you understand what they mean, that's your whole assessment right there. It's, that's the core assessment. Now, I'd like you to grab a piece of paper. I'm hoping you've all got note paper with you. I'd like to take your paper. You're going to need probably more than one sheet. And divide your page into three columns. And at the top of the first column, I would like you to call that iris signs. At the top of the second column, I would like you to call that what questions to ask. At the top of the third column, I would like you to write possible suggestions. All right, you ready? We're going to be flying here. Looking at her eyes, and seeing that she has blue eyes puts her into a category we call lymphatic. That probably gives you some hints as to what might want to go wrong with this, this body. The questions I'm going to ask are, do you have any history of inflammation, pain? Well, I already know she does, so I actually didn't ask that part of the question because she's got rheumatoid arthritis, right? So I, what I actually asked her was, does she have any history of asthma, allergies, skin, or kidney issues? Now the lymphatic constitution is always genetically predisposed to acidic conditions in their body. So not so much the stomach, but in the body. So in their blood, in their muscles, and in their connective tissues. And it often shows up as inflammation, pain, asthma, allergies, arthritis, skin problems, and kidney issues. 
the lymphatic system is also prone to congestion in a blue-eyed person. So then, after I'd gotten that information from her, I asked her, when did this all start? What have you found that helps it? And what have you found that makes it worse? Now, if you're working with someone whom you've already determined is over acid, I want to know, what recommendations are you going to make? And I want you to type those into the question box there. If you know someone is over acid through their body, they've got a lot of muscle pain, they've got joint pain, they've got lots of mucus congestion, maybe they're asthmatic, what kinds of suggestions are you going to make? I'd love it if you'd each just type in one answer. Allison says, no dairy. Good answer. Have them test their pH so they can see how acidic they are. Oh, Donna, that's brilliant. Let them see the proof in the pudding. Good job. Good answer. What else would you suggest? There's quite a few more of you on this call, so I know there's more ideas out there. Greens or green powders, yeah. Reduce the red meat, uh-huh. A low acid forming diet, yeah. An alkalizing diet, two ways of saying the same thing. Good job. Is there anything specifically that you would suggest as the key piece in an alkalizing diet? While you're thinking about that quickly, Allison also says no coffee, tea, or green tea. Good job, Allison. Is there a category? There we go, Lois. Good job. Greens. Yeah, you want your greens in there, right? Because your greens are super alkalizing. So all of those ideas, I hope you wrote those down in possible suggestions. No dairy. Uh, you could, and you know, if you want to test for pH, if you know how to do that, go ahead so you can show your client how acidic they are. Greens are green powders, and uh, we expand that onto green vegetables, leafy greens, as well as Lois suggested. Reduce the red meat, an alkalizing low acid diet, no coffee, tea, or green tea. So when you see a blue-eyed person, those are some key recommendations you can make, even if you don't have a history on them because you know that blue-eyed people are prone to being too acidic. Then we talked about white clouding, and we've got white clouding in here. As well. And when we see the white clouding, that just got in the previous slide. So if you write white clouding at the top of your, your iris sign, and again, we're going to continue to see, um, ask questions about mucus congestion. And you know, you, you may need to find different ways to word things. You might, might need to become a real wordsmith here in order to find ways to ask the questions so the clients will think about answers from a different angle and potentially find more information for you. All right, and so this client actually, when I asked her about inflammation and mucus congestion, she said her sinuses are always drippy and irritated, and then she said, oh yeah, I have eczema. All right, you seeing a picture here? And this is only on the second question. All of her symptoms, sinuses, eczema, um, the, the rheumatoid arthritis are indications of inflammation, irritation, elevated acid, potential allergies. They're all high acid situations. And of course, we're not talking stomach acid. We're talking tissue acid. We're talking acid in her blood and body fluids. There's a range of acid that your body can live within and needs to have. But when we get out of that range, we start to have symptoms. The being outside of that acid range creates the chemistry that leads to asthma, eczema, arthritis, and those are all the same chemistry route. It's just chemistry working on a different tissue, and so it creates a different response in the body. But it's all the same chemistry. So the next thing I notice is these, there's some fibers that are just really, really white. And actually, most of her fibers are quite white. There's a few more that stand out really brightly. When we see this much white fiber in an eye, we know that this person is more prone to easy fevering and or spiking high fevers quickly. So in your, your iris signs column, I want you to write down very white fibers. 
in your questions to ask column, do you have a history of easy fevering or spiking high fevers? Quickly might be, do you fever often? Does an infection that doesn't cause a fever in somebody else cause a fever in you? Now, I'm, I'm not saying fevers are bad. I am saying the predisposition to fevering too often, too high, with very little stimulus is an indication that the immune system is maybe not quite right on track. So what are some ideas that you might suggest to help a person like this keep fevers under control? And I don't mean get rid of fevers. I mean if they're going to fever, they can fever, but they don't have to spike a fever. What kinds of things would you do to help them control how high their fevers go? And that's not really meant to be a trick question because there's a few things you can do. Support the immune system and open up the bowels. Absolutely, those are great ideas, Donna. Drink lots of water, yeah, keep the system flushing. Keep that lymphatic system flushing with by drinking lots of water. Good suggestion. I'm going to throw in one of my favorites. One of my favorites for this kind of a constitution is the liquid catnip and fennel. Now that's a product made by Nature Sunshine Products. We'll talk about them for just 20 seconds later on. But uh, I love catnip and fennel for that fever control kind of end of things. All right, so another thing to remember with this kind of excess of very white fibers is this suggests a predisposition to developing rheumatic conditions. So it's not just the fevers, this tips her towards rheumatoid arthritis right there, right out of the starting block. And then the next thing we notice is that there's a lot of white hugging lots of the area around the pupil. So the question that you want to ask with this, so make sure you write the white zone near pupil or hugging pupil in your iris signs column, and then write down what stomach symptoms do you or have you had. Make sure your person understands what you mean here. Now I say that because many, many years ago, I was working with a, a female client, she's about age 35, she had never been married, she still lived with her parents and she took care of them. She was not sexually active and she was raised in a very protected environment. So in many ways she was quite naive. She came in complaining of stomach aches and I asked her lots of questions about digestion, stomach, elimination, nothing made sense. Her answers did not make sense. So I finally said, can you take one finger and point to where your stomach ache is? And she took that one finger and she put it about two inches above her pubic bone. Ah, I said. So, and recognizing that she was quite, quite a simple person and easily embarrassed about personal things, I asked her the question, so are we talking about a stomach ache that happens when you have your monthly cycle? Yes, she was talking about menstrual cramps. So when you're talking about stomach, make sure your clients know you're talking digestion stomach, make sure they know where that is in their body and just help them out a little bit. So we ask, do you have any of these stomach signs and symptoms? And when we see that, that we've got this, I call this the pom-pom zone. That's my highly technical term for the night. You can quote me on that one. It suggests that there's a real imbalance in the stomach chemistry. So what you suggest here is really going to depend on you drilling deeper with more questions, right? Because genuinely hyperacid with some 
reflux issues, they may be actually hypoacid because you see, and we're going to talk about this sign, I won't let the cat out of the bag, we're going to talk about this dark part of it in a slide or two. So if you have one, I'll ask you a real broad general question, if you had someone who said they have stomach symptoms and it's definitely digestive, what I want to know is what would your next question be? Some of you are being very quiet tonight. I invite you to participate. And those of you who are joining in, I'm loving this, every bit of it. Oh, Allison, that's a great question. Are there specific foods that you can't eat? Or another way to say that, are there foods that you avoid because you know they'll cause a problem? Donna says, do you get pain in the stomach after you eat or before you eat, and is it related to certain foods? Excellent. Nelson says, or foods that you avoid. Good job. Excellent. Right. So you, you would have different recommendations depending on the answers to those questions, wouldn't you? So I'm going to have to leave you to think of what your answers would be there. Um, because, again, you need a little more information than that. You're going to have to get crafty with asking your questions. And then we notice that we've got this dark, frayed-looking edge to a part of the pupil, where the pupillary, uh, the, the tissues just outside the pupil are kind of gray and dirty-looking, where up here they're brighter white. So this frayed, we're going to ask again any history of stomach issues, but specifically now we're going to ask, are there foods that don't digest well? You might have to reshape that question, question to say, are are there foods that upset your stomach? Are there foods that make you feel nauseous? Are there foods that make you burp or pass gas? Are there foods that just feel like they're sitting there like a lead weight? And do you eat those foods or have you learned to avoid them? So again, when you see a dark bit around here, you're going to ask about this and you're going to suspect that the digestion's not so strong. Now, if you suspect their digestion's not as strong as you'd like it to be, that they're maybe hypoacid, what would you recommend to them? And I don't mind if it's a food or a supplement. What would be something in that possible suggestions list? Probiotics or fermented foods, nice idea. Drink apple cider vinegar after a meal, good suggestion. Watch their fat intake, yeah, maybe fat is a bit of the issue here too, so make sure they're not eating high fat foods, good job. Anybody else want to weigh in on this? If, you, if you're ready to hit that send button, go ahead. All right. Now, when we see the smudging out here at the periphery of the iris, there are two kinds of smudging that we can talk about, but we're only going to talk about one of them tonight. This is one kind of smudging, but this is another one. Do you see how this looks a little more even, like it was kind of painted on in one stroke? And um, this looks a little more blobular. Okay, and we've got it over here too, even though it's out of focus over here, we've got this blobby stuff happening. This is talking about the lymphatic system. So we're going to ask, do you have, any, so your symptom, your iris sign is smudging at the periphery of the iris, and your question to ask is any history of lymphatic issues? Again, you might need to take that a bit further. Swollen glands in the neck, people don't think of the glands in their neck that we always talk about as being lymphatic. They just call them swollen glands usually. So you want to talk about swollen glands there or lymph nodes under the arm and in the groin, things like that. You might want to talk about any history of retaining fluid that came up their ankles, for example, feet and into the ankles, just to see how the lymphatics are doing. Now what would you suggest, again, food or supplement for a lymphatic issue?
and I know we've got people here with tons of experience who can answer this, lots of things you can do for lymphatic issues. It might not even be something they eat. Dry skin rub. Yeah, they could be doing the dry skin brushing, couldn't they? Always brushing towards the heart. That is great. Saunas and exercise. Yeah, daily physical activity. Allison says rebounding. These are great suggestions. I hope you're writing all these down because they are really good. Lymphatic massage. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Those are all Excellent suggestions. The mini trampoline and Donna gets into her Nature Sunshine products. Love it. L-Y-M-M-X and Mullen. Absolutely. Potato peel broth. Yeah. Carrot juice. You bet. Those are all excellent, excellent suggestions for getting that lymphatic system moving. Now, as we're doing all these, I hope you're thinking in the back of your brain while I'm nattering at you, how do all of these things connect? What is the common thread that is going to tie all of these together so that we can find our foundation? I then noted that we have this rarefied area at 6 o'clock in both eyes. Now, this is an interesting one because this is the kidney reaction field. You already know that the kidneys are responsible for clearing excess acid from the body. We know that a lymphatic person likes to build too much acid, and the fact that we've got clouding suggests that this body likes to store acid unless things are done to prevent it. Can you see the vicious circle we've got going on here? Kidneys don't remove acid, acid gets stored, inflammation builds, and the kidneys still don't clear the acid, and around and around we go. We can take it one step back to the digestion. Digestion didn't break the foods down well enough. Now we've got acid reactions in the bloodstream, so now the kidneys have to pull the acid out, but they're not doing it, so the acid gets deposited where it's going to create inflammation, and now we've got pain or asthma or allergies or eczema. Does that all make sense? Coming back to kidneys, though, we're going to ask, is there any history of kidney issues of any kind, infection, stones? Do they have they had any blood tests that show they are not clearing their acids properly? Hmm. So what kinds of things would you suggest for supporting the kidneys? What kinds of foods would you do for kidneys? you got to know that question is coming. You can even submit your answers before I ask the question if you want. Ah, good one, Cassia. Parsley, nice. Green drinks and adding parsley, excellent, Lois. Pure water and celery seed or parsley, great, Allison. Totally on the right page. Yeah, those are all excellent, excellent. Good job, good, good job. Lemon and water, yeah, you can do lemon and water. Be a, depending on where you live, and Lois, since I know where you live, I want to do a cautionary note on lemon and water because where we live determines whether lemon is actually a good choice for us or not. Where I live, we can get organic lemons if we want to mortgage our house for them. But they're still almost never vine ripened because vine ripened lemons don't have a huge long shelf life. In order for a lemon to be really helpful with clearing acid and breaking up mucus, it is most effective if it is organic vine ripened. All right, so you just need to be aware that depending on where you live does have a huge impact on what kind of foods you will recommend. Allison says cranberry juice with no sugar added, nice. And Cassia says that's an awesome point about eating where you live, yeah. Donna says pomegranate juice, watermelon, the B complex is pando acid, ginger, dandelion tea, slippery on marshmallow. Oh, Donna, you know your herbs. That is fabulous. Well done. I don't expect everybody had time to write all those down because I read them too fast, and we got to keep going here. Last but not least, we talked about issue, uh, tissues being rarefied up here in the right eye. So between 8 and 9 o'clock is primary, primarily the pleura. 
which is the sac around the lungs, and between 9 and 10 is primarily the lungs themselves. So when we see rarefication or lots of these little holes in the eye, so to speak, we're going to ask, is there any issue, any history of issues with that right lung and or with the pleura? And sometimes what it means when we see it in the right eye is that it is a, an issue that has been handed down from a parent. When it's the right eye, it's handed down from the father. So it might be that this person has no lung problems, but has inherited the possibility of such from her father. We also know that the lungs hold on to emotion, and they, depending on the intensity of things, it can be grief, as in grief over losing something or someone that's important, can also be a death threat if it goes in a full-blown cancer situation. So you may want to ask those kinds of questions as well. So what kind of things would you suggest diet-wise for someone where you saw lung or pleura indicators in the eyes? What are you going to write down in that possible suggestions column? High vitamin C foods, all right. Thank you for that, Lois. Mullen, lobelia tea, or diffuser. Good job, Allison, good suggestions. Mullen and lobelia are fabulous for the lungs, I totally agree. What about foods? What foods do you recognize? Do you know your signature foods? What food in particular kind of looks like the lung tissue if you were to cut a lung in half into layers and lay it open? Okay, so Donna says no dairy, use marshmallow root, carrot and celery juice, pomegranates, great. Kasha says liver, not quite. Lois says walnut, no, that would be more brain food. A walnut half looks more like your brain. Allison says lentils or beans, mm, not quite. These are good suggestions though. Good nutrition I'm hearing here. Broccoli, broccoli. You've got the stem that's like the, bronchia, the bronchi and then it branches off into the bronchia, uh, bronchioles and then you've got the alveoli which are the blossom end of your broccoli. So broccoli is a great thing by the signature of foods to use for lung issues. Beta carotene rich vegetables, beta carotenes are almost always good, almost always good. You'd probably never go wrong. It may not be super specific in this case, but it certainly is something that you could use. What about horseradish? Well, I'll tell you, horseradish will break up the mucus, won't it, Lois? It certainly will. I don't know if horseradish specifically strengthens the lungs as well, but it certainly will break up any mucus that's in there. So we now want to look at, a, just touch on some sclerology here and tie this together a little bit. So while the eye rides are showing us the genetic strengths and the genetic potentials, the sclera tells us about what's happening right now. So as I mentioned earlier, I use the sclera to define the parts of the program that are going to be changing as we see progress in the body. So we've got the foundation level, which is primarily food, maybe a few core supplements that the person will probably use for the next 10, 15, 20 years. But on top of that, we're going to put a dressing of a program, uh, a small program that addresses a specific issue using their foods. The blood vessels show us where there might be things struggling, like this is a little bit engorged. Over here we have one that splits into a Y, we call that a trauma fork. Right, so we've got some things happening in here, we've got some that are actually uh, hanging on to the edge of the iris. So what we see with all of these things is a predisposition to, or a current activity in rather, things like allergies or a physical trauma to a body part that hasn't totally healed or we might see that there's a congestion in the circulation in a part of the body as it corresponds to the sclera, we'll see a predisposition towards allergies. So there's lots of things that we see in the sclera that are very, very current. So what did 
what recommendation, coming back to our original set of eyes, did I start with? I didn't do anything with her sclera right at that point in time. She wasn't going to be open to a lot of things, so I had to keep it simple. So before I tell you what I actually did, with what you've seen here, what is a common theme that runs through a lot of what we've seen when we tie it together? What is the root cause and what is the end res what is this the thing that's happening because of the root cause that's causing so many symptoms for her? Does that make sense? What is the root cause? Okay, so Lois is saying inflammation. I think you're suggesting that that is what happens because of the root cause. There's something that comes before the inflammation, and inflammation is certainly in this chain. She's acidic, and why is she acidic, Donna? What is causing that? High acid food or lifestyle? Allison, good suggestion. Let's go one step before that. Because some people can have a high acid food and lifestyle, and they're fine. But in her case, could be emotional. What did we say we were looking at when we looked at the center here? And Allison, yes, there's a predisposition, stomach issues. Good job, Kasia, good job. So we're looking at stomach. So that's our root. We want to do something with the stomach. <laughs> yeah, you can celebrate that one, Kasia, way to go. And then we talked about inflammation and acid, and those are the other things that need to be interrupted, right? We need to be calming those down as well. And so if you think that, if you agree with me that stomach is the root cause, followed by food choices, of course, because if the stomach is weak and you do lousy food choices, you don't stand a chance, and that that's all leading to high acid, which leads to inflammation, which leads to all of her symptoms. What would be your top three recommendations for this client? Yeah, Betty says leaky gut. I have no doubt with what we see here that there's probably leaky gut involved as well. Absolutely. I just read a study today. While you're typing in your top three recommendations that ties leaky gut into as being a key cause of polycystic ovarian syndrome. Some of you know that aside from iridology, PCOS and infertility are two of my favorite pet projects. Okay, so your top three recommendations could be foods, could be supplements, could be lifestyle changes. pH balancing with prebiotics and greens. Yeah, okay. Good good suggestions there, Betty. Water with lemon, right? Chew your food properly and less stress. Good suggestions, Kasia. Probiotics, organic, or good food choices and exercise to move lymph fluid around. Good choices, Allison. If someone else is typing theirs, we'll come back and pick them up in just a second. Here's what I suggested, because I wanted to be this. I wanted this to be very specific, and very doable. I knew, with this client as with all my clients, that if I give them too much homework or too big of a piece of homework, it's not going to get done well, and they're going to feel like a failure, and then they're not going to come back. So here's what I suggested, that our first key for acid balancing was that she eliminate the coffee. And then with coffee, I lump green tea and black tea as well. So get rid of the coffee. It's very acidifying, leads to inflammation. It's not a great choice. I don't care what you think about antioxidants in it, which I think is a bunch of a bow hunk in the long run. I also, and that's going to help with starting to balance her acids, and then I suggested very specifically that she start increasing her leafy greens because she was eating almost none of them, and I suggested that she start with one cup a day every day this week for sure. Next week, build it to two cups so that by the time I saw her again, she was up to four full cups of leafy greens. For supplements, I suggested that she use a Nature Sunshine product called UC3J, which in the States it's called Intestinal Soothe and Build, because this is very calming and very soothing both to the stomach lining, in case that's irritated, 
and to the intestinal tract, but it has herbs in it that are great for the kidneys as well. So it hits a lot of her key points all at once. And to help her come off the coffee, I suggested stress formula. In the States, that's called NutriCalm, which is a B vitamin with vitamin C with herbs for the adrenals to help her keep her, her level while she's coming off the uh, coffee. And Kasia says she still loves her coffee. Sorry, Kasia, you know what? I hear that so much. And I'm always impressed when people who love it do the experiment of giving it up for a month and see how much better they feel. And then if they want to go back to drinking, I don't care. It's not my choice after that. I can't do anything about it. They've got information to work with. So I kept my recommendations for this client really, really simple. A couple of food changes that were easy to do, well, a hard one and an easy one. A couple of supplements because I wanted her to be really successful in baby steps rather than a huge failure in one step. Then over the next five or six months, we kept working every month we would meet up and I would tweak her program a little bit more, working some on the foundation and some on the, the top level, on the, the, the sclera level, until we finally got her to where she is in such a good place that she only comes in about twice a year now for a general tweaking. It's lovely. So, oh, I should have had these up. Those are the things that I suggested to her. And, uh, so now that you understand the iris and the sclera, you can, when you understand them, integrate all of your nutrition, herbal, and lifestyle knowledge. You can then prioritize which pieces of education and homework to share with your clients today and the next session and the session after that. And I actually keep a little list in the margin of my notes for each client that says what I'm going to work on and in what sequence. You can easily create bite-sized, doable pieces of homework for your clients in your client sessions and you've eliminated your unpaid homework right then and there. Integrating iridology with nutrition and or herbology and lifestyle into an assessment and recommendation process is going to help you do these things. Trash those lengthy intake forms. Seriously, the only form I have my clients fill out is one that's name, address, phone number, email address, do I have permission to email you? That's it. Sign it saying that, that they've agreed to this and that they know I can't diagnose and prescribe and we're done. That's all they do. Nothing else. We do the rest of it together through the irises. You, uh, knowing all of this will help you to know exactly which problems to address first and what are the best recommendations. It will significantly reduce or eliminate your research and program design time that you don't get paid for. It will help you to stop over overwhelming your clients with too much info while encouraging them to become long-term repeat clients. And it will help you to look incredibly smart even if you feel insecure as you ask client specific questions and create those programs right in your sessions. Who wouldn't like a little dose of confidence, right? So even from three feet away, and this is what blew away my meetup person from earlier this week as we were sitting across the table, I didn't have my magnifying glass. I didn't have my little flashlight. I just saw some things in her eyes, these are not her eyes by the way, that I could recognize from across a table and was able to give her a little bit of information right then and there. And when you can do that, you know, the moment they walk into your office, you greet them with a handshake or a hug, however you choose to greet them, and you look right in their eyes, you get that snapshot in your head you can begin creating your mental list of questions to ask. Now as we look at this person, at this eye, we see this big blood vessel that's really, really obvious right here and it splits and it's got a loop in it. A lot of things going on right here. I'm going to ask her about her thyroid, her throat and her bronchioles. We also see a predisposition to allergies and over here, if this was clearer, you would see that this is actually a predisposition to blood pressure issues and to spider veins and varicose veins. Okay, how many key issues did I hit right there in less than a minute? Right, when I understand those things, I know what questions to ask. Now we're never going to discuss 
everything we see with our client in one session. That's called fire hosing or snowballing. And I think with either of those images, you know what I mean. It would be too overwhelming. It would take you seven hours instead of one. So we're going to prioritize right from the get-go, address a symptom they brought in and a root cause as well. Now, those of you who are going, yeah, this looks great. I've got a program coming up called the Confident Nutritionist Comprehensive Clinical Iridology, and it's going to teach you all of this and more. If you like acting fast, it starts tomorrow. Registration actually closes at 8 a.m. tomorrow. It's been, I've been offering it for, the, um, for registration for the past several weeks, so this isn't like it's just a last minute deal here. To get in on it, go to iridology.education slash confident nutritionist, but hang on for just a second because we've got some more eyes and some more stuff to talk about. So in, what's covered in the course, you're going to learn beginning to advanced iridology. You'll know what, what's different from a blue eye, from a hazel eye, from a brown eye. You will learn sclerology. You'll learn what all the little marks in an eye mean. So when we see, and I should just, when we see colors like this in an eye, when we see closed loops like this in an eye, when we see white fibers, when we see rarefied areas, when we see blobs coming around the edges, you're going to learn what all of those mean, what questions to ask, and how to work with it. You will be prepared by the end of the course with the iridology to actually take the International Iridology Practitioners Association certification exam if you choose. That's an additional fee paid to IPA. We'll do basic nutrition and basic herbology, but only as they relate to iridology. So I'm not going to teach nutrition and herbology. It's great if you have a foundation in at least one of those. And then we, uh, we build on that a little bit. I will also teach you how to create therapeutic priorities for your clients as they come in. So what's included? You get 20 live webinar sessions. It's roughly 40 hours. And the content is all also pre-recorded and edited into short topic videos. It's stored on a student site for you to review for 18 months from our start date. So that means we have our class as a live webinar just like this. And you're thinking three weeks down the road, gee, what was that we said? You can go back to your textbook that you received digitally, download it in weekly installments, but you can also go back to the videos. And you can review there. Each class starts with a review of the previous week. Each week has lots of in-class practice and interaction, lots of discussion. And when you've attended 80% of the classes, you'll get a certificate of attendance. You won't be a certified iridologist because that takes the exam to do that. Here's what you will learn. You'll learn how to create individualized programs right in your sessions and eliminate that unpaid homework time. I know I harp on that a lot, but that's an important one because so many of you could be helping so many more people and increasing your income and you could stop thinking about getting a quote unquote real job if that's where you're at thinking you gotta pay the bills, right? You'll learn how to do a base assessment in five minutes or less without lengthy intake paperwork and while developing rapport. You saw how quickly it was how quick it was to read the eyes. And then you ask the questions. You'll learn how to only ask questions that are relevant to, to your client's needs, how to prioritize the problems your clients need help with how to connect what you know about nutrition and or herbology to what you discover using integrated iridology, and you'll learn how to do a deeper assessment for more direction and understanding of your clients when it's needed. So what's the tuition? That's always the question. It's 1995 Canadian. Now some of you are Americans and you maybe don't know how exchange works. I find that um, since everything revolves around US currency, a lot of people who don't live in Canada don't understand this. The US dollar is worth about 30% more. So when Americans pay for something in Canadian dollars, knock about 30% off that price. Your credit card company will do the converting and they will make it to be the equivalent. So that actually comes out to about 1395 American right now. And so there's, uh, I mean, it's such a deal, right? 
And, but it's closing soon. Registration is closing tomorrow morning. You want to get in on this. Iridology.education. Confident nutritionists do not capitalize the C and the N. I keep forgetting to fix that slide. It'll bounce if you do that. It all needs to be lowercase confident nutritionist. Here is um, a testimonial from a student who's actually with us tonight. I won't put her on the hot seat. I did that once and she was so gracious. Uh, we're just wrapping up the session she's in. We are, and this is, so this is a few weeks old. We are seven weeks in and I can officially call myself an iridologist in training. I can now write an assessment and read many eyes with confidence. The course, the amount of learning is enormous and there's a lot of depth to this course. Judith's teaching is professional and easy to learn as she stops for questions, has great slides and reviews every week. Her students are her priority and their understanding of the information is imperative to her. It absolutely is. My goal, this is an aside, is to turn out the best iridologists in the world. Just saying. There's a student website page with all the PDFs for downloading and videos to watch. The page is e easily accessible. It is a one-of-a-kind course that is so challenging of your skills and exciting to see what's next every week. There's also a private Facebook page for questions, comments, and assessments, and just keeping in touch between weeks. I would definitely recommend this course to anyone who's even thinking of taking an iridology course. Judith is a wealth of knowledge and a fantastic mentor. I love this course and I know you will too, Allison Taylor in Calgary. So when you see an eye like this, you might think, where do I begin? Because you know, this person's got all of these little petal shapes in their eye. One thing it tells us is that they're creative. Another thing it tells us is that they're probably prone to blood sugar imbalances. And the darker the space is inside, the higher the risk, the less reactive the tissues are. We look and we see how dark the tissue is hugging the pupil. Hmm. So we're going to need to talk about what? You already know this because we've done it about seven times tonight. What is it that hugs the pupil? It's the what zone? Lightning fingers. Oh, someone's got to hit that send button quick. Digestive or nutritive? Well done. That's my student for you. Good job. You passed tonight. Good job, Gold Star. We also notice, though, that there's a lot of uh, blood vessels. Look at this sclera, look at how busy this is. We've got a pterygium, so we know we're doing some liver stuff that's going wrong or is stressed out. We've got this knot of vessels right here that suggests kidney issues. We've got this engorged vessel coming up here which suggests that any organs that are in this area where the reflex points are in this area of the eye have compromised circulation and again all the way down this side. So when we use the sclerology we have so much more information and when we see sclerology and we see these things, these can sometimes and often these indicate problems that are still brewing, problems that haven't become clinical yet. So if you see a blood vessel in the white of the eye and you talk to your client about it and know they don't have any symptoms like that at this point in time. You know that it's a symptom that is, is brewing, it's a condition that's brewing and you might just be the one who's able to nip it in the bud and help them avoid a problem. Now there's a bunch of bonuses with the class, over $1,200 worth. First off, you get an IPA student membership. Now that's really important in my opinion because it lets you, during the year of that membership, rub shoulders with like-minded iridologists and holistic practitioners. If you want to be where the birds of a feather are flocking together, you want to be with IPA. I signed a contract with them as an IPA certified instructor that each of my students would receive as a gift from me an IPA student membership. Every week you get to download from the student website the updated version of the cheat sheet. We add to it every week and it's how to recognize, um, how to recognize different, the different iris signs and what questions to ask. 
And Donna says, do you get discounts with IPA for their seminars? Yes, you do. I believe you do. Small discounts, not huge. Um, but yeah, you do get a bit of a discount. You also have, we've got the private Facebook group, which is worth about $247 where we continue the conversation about classes. You can post questions, you can post iridology photos, you can get clarification. It is a great place for you to just continue the conversation and get more support in between. About once a month, we have a student-driven coaching webinar, which means that students submit to me their iris photos, their case studies. If they don't have an iridology camera, I don't expect you to have a camera yet but your case studies, things like that, I upload them onto PowerPoints and we meet for an extra hour of tutorial, student-led discussion where we're going to answer your questions, talk about challenges you're having, clarify things that you're seeing. We do that about once a month and we're on there for at least an hour. If nobody submits anything, then we don't do it. It's just a lost session. As my students, you also have the option of coming to Calgary for a one-day live IPA exam preparation day where we practice iridology live. We make sure you've got all of your information totally straight to sit to write the exam the following day here in Calgary. And oops, although you do need to know that if you live in another city and you can't make this, well, it was a bonus, it's not mandatory. And there are ways, IPA has ways for you to do the exam in your own hometown. So you don't necessarily have to come to Calgary to do your exam. And sometimes you might even be challenged with a darker brown eye. And I've worked with eyes darker than this as well. This is a 10-year-old girl whose body is so full of inflammation and congestion. Look at this. Look at this. And this. And these loop-de-loops in here. From certain perspectives, and allergies, from certain perspectives, this eye makes me very, very sad to think that her body is already this stressed. From other perspectives, I get really, really happy when I see young people and I see their eyes and I go, I can help you with this. This suggests problem XYZ might be trying to boil up in you. Let's do things to prevent that. And that gets me super, super excited. All right. Some of you are saying, okay, 1995, got it. Want to take the class. Really want to take the class. Don't have that much money sitting in my hip pocket right now. Do you have a payment plan? I do. It's a four pay at 547 a month. So when you register tonight, that first payment at 547, and then every month for four payments in total, your your 547 would come out of your credit card automatically. That just gives you access to absolutely everything that I have to offer for this class. Why should you oops, right. And regardless of which way you choose to pay, the bonuses are nearly 1200 I can only do math on Mondays and Fridays, not on Tuesdays, apparently. So again, iridology.education, lowercase confident, lowercase nutritionist to get registered. Canadians, I'm sorry, I have to charge GST extra for you guys. I'm sorry, but at least you're only paying Canadian dollars for the course. So why would you want to become an IPA certified iridologist? Number one, to have a professional, internationally recognized affiliation. And international it is. At the symposium last year, we had people, yes, from all over North America. That's not a big whoop, right? Including Mexico. I mean, you expect them to go to Las Vegas, right? This year we're in Orlando next month. But we had people that came all the way over from the Philippines and Taiwan. Or was it Singapore? It was somewhere over there where their flight was like 20 gazillion hours. Right? Huge. It is an international organization. To have opportunities to keep up to date on the latest iridology research, I love IPA because they, their curriculum changes based on new research. When I originally certified with IPA, it was before they were IPA, they've been through several iterations. In 1993, the curriculum was very different than it is now. 
It is so much more expanded. And some of the things that we were taught as gospel true back in 93 have been disproven with current research. And we've all had to relearn the new things as they come out. So some teachers are stilted. They get stuck with what they know and it can never change. IPA makes us keep up to speed. Add your energy to the movement to have iridology recognized by healthcare systems worldwide. Wouldn't that be wonderful? If you could do an iris analysis, collect your payment for it, give your client a receipt that would be recognized by their insurance or as a deduction for their taxes, and demonstrate to your clients that you have been properly trained in the most current, valid, and accurate iridology assess assessment techniques available. Truly, they are. The IPA certification process is a separate process, and there's a few more details that have to happen, but people get most surprised when they find out there is a fee for it. And that's because it's, it's just a part of the process where you pay a SIT fee for the exam. It's $175 payable to IPA. It is US dollars. I'm sorry, my Canadian friends. It's not payable to me. I don't get that money. Um, but I will supervise the exam. And when you're ready to take the test, and that's why I try to set up one exam date for each section. Now, having said that, the exam date for the class that starts tomorrow is set. If you are not ready for the exam that day, that doesn't matter. You can defer it to the next exam date, and I will not have a problem with that. Some people like a few extra months to study, to practice, to really get their skills refined. That's great. Take whatever time you need, and when you're ready, let me know, and we'll put you into the next exam date. Okay, so you don't have to, you're not locked into a date. I mean, maybe on that exam date, your brother is getting married. Well, we know what's going to win, right? So we're a little flexible here. Or you can take it locally again, right? You can do it locally if you want to. Again, iridology.education.com. Confident nutritionist. So it is time to get registered. 1995, all in one fell swoop, or four payments of 547. Oops, and registration is closing at 8 a.m. tomorrow. Don't wait till the morning. That's 8 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. So if you're in a different time zone, just pay attention. Do it tonight. Get it taken care of so that you don't forget it and you don't go to hit that send button. It's 8 o'clock in your zone, but it's 9 o'clock in mine. That would be unhappy. All right. So... Um, so your course is doing basic sclerology. We're doing sclerology right in this course. Yes, Donna. We're doing sclerology right in this course because you need to know how to correlate the iris and the sclera with your nutrition or your herbs or your nutrition and your herbs and your lifestyle, right? We want the full package here. That is where the power is in being an iridologist. You get the whole, the full meal deal. Now, Donna, you took an iridology class with me, if I recall, mm, I want to say five or six years ago, back when I was teaching less information, so it was six two-hour classes. I want you to put it in perspective that now we're doing 20 two-hour classes plus tutorial sessions plus between class support. So you can see that it is a much fuller class than what I taught many years ago, right? Do you have to be live on the courses? Um, to count for your attendance, you do for at least 80% of them. However, having said that, every topic that is covered in the course is in the manual that you will receive and it's a manual that I've written to make sure it totally correlates with what I'm teaching and that it totally agrees with the IPA curriculum and every topic that's covered in your manual also has a video clip on the student website. So if you have to miss a few classes because I don't know maybe you're going to Mexico for a holiday and you just know you're not going to want to be online for two hours out of your vacation, that's okay. <laughs> I thought you were. And she says, I am. It's okay. Because once we've taught the lesson, the website material gets loaded in. You've got 
You can study it as many times as you want. You can download the manual and join us on the Facebook page. And if you have questions left over, bring them to the tutorial sessions that we hold once a month. My goal is to give every one of my students the support they need to sit for the exam when they feel ready and pass it on the first go round. Allison, who is actually in my class right now, says it really allows you to use your skills in herbology and nutrition. That's what this is all about. This is about making you a more confident practitioner, able to work your, your, with your clients in a more precise manner. Classes are Wednesday. They start tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Donna, if I remember, you're in the Eastern Time Zone, so that would be 8 p.m. your time. Wednesday nights, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Yay, Donna says she's in. Donna, it'll be so exciting to have you in class again. I love having people come back for classes because I, we have a rapport established. I love new people too. I don't want anyone to think I don't love new people. But I love having repeat students because um, we just, they enrich the learning experience for everybody else. Donna, you're going to be surprised because some of what I taught you even six years ago has been updated. Allison says you will love it. And I hope you will. And everybody else, and Lois says she's in too. Yes! Way to go, Lois. It'll be good to have you too. So this is very exciting. Does anybody have any other questions that they would like to ask? As soon as I've processed, uh, yes, I've been looking for this. Oh, Donna, I'm so glad you have. Now, Donna, just so you know, sclerology happens late in the course because there is so much more iridology I have to teach you before we get to sclerology. But we do the sclerology, I promise we do. And we do it very well. Allison hasn't even gotten to the sclerology yet. But it's coming, it's coming. Yeah, we haven't done it yet, have we? But it is coming. It's, um, I'm actually, yeah, it, it's in, in your pipeline for, I think it's, not tonight, not or not this week, not next week, but the week after, Alice, and we start with the sclerology. All right. So for anybody else who, who uh, now, Michelle, you've got your hand raised. Um, are you able to type whatever your question is? If not, I can unmute you. It looks like you do have a microphone. Michelle, I'm going to unmute you. Do you have a question or a comment? Comment, Michelle? I just wanted to say I, I think I'm in for registering in the course as well. I just, uh, I, I can't type in on my question box. I don't know why. Oh, oh sometimes the technology and all its wonders, right? Do you have any questions about the course you'd like to ask? Uh, no, not at the moment. No, okay. I'm just very interested in it because of the sclerology. Oh, excellent. Well, you heard me say that happens later on, and you want the iridology as the foundation anyways. We call that triangulation when you're using at least two and sometimes three indicators to really work on an area well. Sort of one point confirms another confirms another, and it makes it, your programs that you develop so much more powerful. Excellent. Yeah. Welcome aboard. I'm excited to have you with us too, Michelle. I look forward to having you in class tomorrow night. Great. Thank you. Same here. Perfect. All right. Well, it looks like that might be all of our questions. I don't see any other hands raised and I don't see any other questions coming in. Uh, I'm excited to have so many of you joining me and I'm looking forward to class tomorrow. Now, the one last thing you need to know, those of you who are joining me, as soon as your payment clears through PayPal, um, I will get in there, and it might be tomorrow morning actually, after that 8 a.m. cutoff, so get it done tonight for me so that we don't have any last minute pressure. I will go in and I will manually send you an email that includes uh, two things. Number one, instructions on how to get into the Facebook group, where to find the Facebook group. And I will approve you into our private Facebook group. 
our closed Facebook group, and number two, you need to register for the link for the webinars. It's a one-time thing, so you click on that registration link, enter your information and press enter. That sends your information to the webinar host, and I need to go in and manually approve you in. This is why I've got an 8 a.m. cutoff tomorrow, is so that I've got time in the day with, between clients and the other things that I do in my office to make sure that I've approved everybody in so they can start their course. Um, it will also have the logon information for your student website so you can go in and start looking at your lesson one materials and you can kind of get a feel for where we're going to be. And then tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Mountain Time for two hours, we're going to start being best friends. We're going to have so much fun. You're going to love this course, and I'm going to love having you in it. So with that, my friends, it looks like there's no more questions tonight. I really look forward to having you in class with me tomorrow. Thank you so much. Have a good evening, and talk to you tomorrow. Good night.